Good morning. Welcome everyone to day two of COGEX 2018. The Lightning Stage is a showcase of technologies and strategies from across the world. Here we discover the most inspiring large companies, startups, and scale ups as a pitch the ideas, tools, technologies that will change the world. Our first session will be presented by Nikola Merksic, hope I got that right, from Poly AI. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, if we look back to last Christmas, and the top selling item on Amazon. The first top two selling items were the, their very own smart speaker, the Amazon Echo, and a smaller version, the Echo Dot. And um, estimates by analysts say that up to 20% of American homes right now already own a smart speaker. And they expect this number to quadruple in the next two years. Now, knowing um, all the deficiencies that these things currently have, it's quite fascinating you know, the market penetration and the usage that they've managed to see so far. And um, um, this is happening in large part because of their promise and what virtual personal assistance could be as the final frontier uh, of human-computer interaction. So if we take a glimpse into the future of what we could expect from these things one day, if, say, I'm organizing a wedding or a very big party, Today, I need to go identify the venues, find reviews for them, read them all, learn about them, um, you know, figure out what's important, and then make a decision. And just to read all of those things, I need you know, hours, if not days. An artificially intelligent virtual assistant could read these reviews in a blink of an eye. Now, it knows my preferences. It knows what kind of music I like, how much I'm willing to pay, what areas I like, who I'd like to invite. It can confirm, perhaps, with me whether the venue is okay when it picks one, and then proceed to book the venue, invite everyone, and handle the whole thing for me. Now, this is very futuristic, but the first step to getting there is connecting these virtual assistants to third-party services and their content. And even though these assistants are built by tech giants, it's not very likely that they will go in and implement all the services that I need to actually support this whole booking scenario. So if you think back to the iPhone, it became the next platform after the web, only when Apple introduced the App Store and turned these phones that we already had in our pockets into these ubiquitous devices that we now use to consume information, entertainment, and communication. So where are we with an App Store for virtual personal assistants? If you look at the top four Alexa skills, the, the, the four most popular ones, you'll see that they allow you to hear recipes and ask the assistant to bark, meow, and fart. Now, this doesn't really seem like the next generation of human-computer interaction. And um, when we think about why these are the best things we see and the most popular ones, we, you might be inclined to think that we don't have the tools to build these things, and yet, all the big tech companies and many other independent uh, providers are building these tools. There are many of them, and they're very good, actually. You can build a chatbot or an Alexa skill in a matter of hours, if not in less than an hour for simple scenarios. So there are 15,000 Alexa skills and tens of thousands of Facebook Messenger bots, but none of them, well, there are a few good ones, but the majority are not used at all. And uh, I think to explain this phenomena, we have to go back to the first technical platform that um, in, in kind of like a look at the web. When we built uh, websites initially, we built many of them. We built them for decades. We figured out how to solve the technical challenges, and then the whole science of user experience design evolved on top of that. And only when we understood it well enough did we know enough about the whole process to actually create tools like WordPress or Wix.com, where you can, you know, uh, drag and drop a website in a matter of minutes and create a pretty decent website. Um, so what's happening in virtual assistants is that people are trying to take a shortcut. And we are building tools without actually seeing an end product. And we think that that's not the way to go. 
So the first problem that we have is we need to solve the technical challenges. And with personal assistance, there are many. The first one is speech recognition, how you transfer our voice into text. The second one is transferring the text into actionable user intents. And this requires a lot of machine learning, and it's still a very open problem. The third one could be the most challenging one, and that is if you actually want to have a conversation, so not single turn question answering, you need to be able to uh, interact with databases, third-party API calls, decide what the user wants to do, perform the action for them, and continue the conversation, follow up. And typically in academia, we use reinforcement learning for these problems. And that's not something that you can just give to an average developer and tell them, train a conversational agent using reinforcement learning. We're not there yet. We're not going to be there for a very long time. So if you just look at the first part, the natural language understanding, and you want to build the simplest of Alexa skills today, say you want to set an alarm. And um, right now you'd have to write down hundreds of rephrasings to actually then train a natural language understanding component that would implement this. And in doing this, we're actually pushing the hard part of the problem back to the developer. We're forcing them to curate the machine learning data set for us. Now, machine learning has been democratized with tools like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and it's very easy to train a model, but the hard part is getting the data set. And by making developers do this, we're actually just avoiding the hard part of the problem. And um, this is a problem that a lot of these uh, frameworks have. They're asked the users to provide data without actually telling them how to do it. The developers are not trained, and that's the first big blocker. Now, for those more technologically sophisticated companies with kind of like more developers and more experience in this, maybe they get over the first hurdle and do language understanding decently well. What happens then is then when they want to support a slightly more complicated conversational scenario, what happens is that they're just out, out of depth. They um, see, this is an example by one of our developers, uh, to build a taxi ordering app. And the moment you start building these dialogue trees, you get these things that are hard to read, hard to create, hard to maintain, hard to update, and you're stuck. It doesn't scale and you give up. And this is why there are so many uh, abandoned, orphaned Alexa skills and chatbots. Um, so what we are doing at Poly AI is we're building a platform for conversational AI that's based on everything that we've done in um, our academic careers. So we use deep learning for natural language understanding and gender generation. And we collect the data ourselves using our proprietary data collection platform. Uh, we've developed this data collection over many years, and it collects data at a fraction of the cost paid by pretty much any of our competitors. For the uh, control of the data flow itself, we have other proprietary technology that lets you use Lego-like components to actually build the right kind of user experience and control the use cases that you want to have control over. Our platform is domain agnostic. It uses the same model whether you're uh, booking flights, restaurants, whether you're ordering taxis, or playing music. It's multilingual inherently, and the model supports many languages at once with very little training data for languages other than English. And of course, they connect to all the platforms. So why can we do this? Um, we have 10 people right now, and six of us did machine learning PhDs or postdocs at Cambridge. We spent between five to 10 years working on dialogue, and this is really, for many of us, our mission in life and what we've been really focused on. Um, between us, we published more than 100 research papers, have more than 2,000 citations, and uh, not only did we work on this in academia, but we also have experience from almost all the big tech giants working on this, including um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook AI. So if you're interested in building conversational capability and you've tried and failed with these developer tools, please come talk to us in the, in the startup village. And if you're interested in working on this, also come talk to us. Thanks. Thank you, Nicola. That was great to hear. Um, if you do like to speak to um, Poly AI, they can be found in the startup village downstairs. Um, so next up, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Anthony Ricks from Granta Innovation. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anthony Ricks. I'm CEO of Granta Innovation. Uh, let me start by talking about uh, uh, my goal for this presentation. I'd like to explain to you why I think AI is broken for a lot of enterprise applications. 
uh, and then what we're doing to fix it. Firstly, what do we do? Uh, Granter Innovation is a consulting firm focusing on AI for business. We do what it says on the tin, we research, we consult, and we develop AI systems for ambitious companies. We're using this to develop our own platforms that effectively meet reusable uh, needs across many business sectors. We're grounded in quite deep research. I can't boast six um, Cambridge PhDs, but I, I'm a Cambridge graduate myself, and I have a PhD too. Um, uh, across emerging technologies, uh, one of our favorite areas is blockchain debunking. So if you're interested to hear uh, me telling it as it is about blockchain, uh, or find out more about our research on AI and AI ethics, please subscribe at our website. I'm going to talk about now about four hard problems with AI. The first big challenge is actually knowing what you can do and how. If you're trying to do image recognition or speech recognition, those are fairly well-trodden paths. But if you're an enterprise with business processes that you want to improve or to automate, it's a much harder problem. What do you do? Do you use deep, uh, deep learning? Do you use Bayesian regression? Uh, you know, the, 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 the tools, the challenges are major. Uh, and just hiring data scientists doesn't solve the problem because they don't necessarily have the cross-disciplinary grounding that you need. You need a lot of data. Uh, to do a large deep learning model, uh, you need millions, millions of data points. And they can be incredibly expensive to source. There are some things that deep learning can't do. Uh, and I'll talk more about one of those. Um, and lastly, something that you do need to be aware of is vendor lock-in. It's relatively easy to go to the major platforms and take them your data uh, and build a workflow that, uh, that, that meets uh, you know, the needs, perhaps, of your short-term business opportunities. But then you're locked in. Um, how do you navigate that? Our general approach to this is a very human-focused one. We bring experienced people. Uh, we understand what our customers are trying to do. Uh, we're capable of doing the very fundamental enabling research that needs to be done uh, to solve your problems, uh, or, or just to fill in the gaps and find other people who've solved the problem too. Uh, we've got the scale to build a system uh, working with our customer and with top-class partners. Uh, and then we work inside our customers to train their teams, to grow their knowledge, because ultimately, for us, the success of our customer will lie in them being able to take that AI business further forward. Uh, and lastly, we can be there to support you over the next decade as you put these systems into production. I'm going to talk about my first AI startup. The company was called Cytechnics. We solved a, a really sim simple but difficult problem. How do you rate the quality of a phone call? It's the 1990s. Mobile and VoIP are going to transform the way that the world communicates. But if they're going to do that, we need to solve some really hard problems that exist today about quality. And if we can't measure quality, we can't fix it, we can't manage it. The way you measure quality is well understood uh, and standardized by the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU. Uh, and it uses this scale called the mean opinion score, a simple one to five rating from bad to excellent. The reason this is hard for AI uh, comes down to three problems. The first is how do we represent sounds in the way that people hear them? and also represent the things that people don't hear, because there's no point us saying that something's been distorted if actually the change was imperceptible to the human ear. The second challenge is how do we hear differences in the way that people do? Uh, and the third is predicting quality, building up enough data to persuade an entire industry, the telecoms industry, uh, to uh, accept uh, the evidence of what you're doing as being truly the solution that scales uh, for their business. I built this for my PhD. Uh, we got to better than human performance in 2001. The model looks like this. It's quite unlike any of the classic AI systems that you'll be familiar with. Uh, the way it works, since I've got a speech processing person in the room, uh, we transform uh, the input to the network and the output, 
Uh, we then have several stages where we can compare these. We extract the errors as a human would have heard them uh, and use that to predict quality. But even in working in, for seven years in this space, I got 500 data points. So this was not a candidate for deep learning. But the thing that's funny now is people are using this model to train deep learning algorithms uh, because you can start to apply deep Q learning. What I hope is that this has illustrated to you how human creativity and the involvement of an expert who's grounded in deep fundamentals of research in the space can allow you to do something that's genuinely different. So I'm looking for companies who'd like to do something like that for their business. Uh, and if that's you, get in touch. My business cards are at the back, and I'd also encourage you to subscribe at our website and we'll send you our latest research on AI and on blockchain. Thank you very much. Thank you there, Anthony. Um, Granta Innovation can be found in the startup village downstairs. Um, on to our next presenter, um, Dev Amratia from Implan. Welcome him. Okay. Hi, I'm Dev, and I'm here to talk to you about how NPLAN solves a big problem in construction. Big engineering projects mean big delays. The Berlin-Brandenburg Airport is now eight years behind schedule. The Tesla Gigafactory should have been operating at full capacity by now. The Battersea Power Station should have opened in 1986. These aren't stories of mismanagement. They're stories of unmanageable complexity. We're expecting humans to understand projects that are beyond human comprehension. Each project has hundreds of thousands of tasks, from pouring concrete to installing cables. And each will be different every time you do it. Asking someone to figure out how long a project should take is like asking them to count the grains of sand on a beach. When you come to think of it, it's incredible that some projects are completed at all. NPLAN understands complex construction projects that no human can. We have assembled the largest proprietary collection of project schedules in the world and have trained our AI to anticipate delays and recommend improvements. Using NPLAN, project managers, construction managers, planners, and schedulers can correct delays before they occur. As our cities become larger and a vital part to the growth of our economies, planning will play an increasingly vital role in, technology will play an increasingly vital role in planning. Take High Speed 2. It's the largest construction project the UK has done since the Victorian era. It'll cost us 56 billion pounds and take us 15 years to complete. And I'm really proud to tell you that we have agreed a paid trial with High Speed 2 to help them avoid such delays. And we're not stopping there. We have 12 such trials going on at the moment, covering 12 six of the 10 largest UK construction companies, two of the largest engineering construction companies in Japan, and three other mega projects, just like High Speed 2. We've won awards for what we do. This is considered the most promising innovation breakthrough for infrastructure construction. And to let that sink in for a second, the last major innovation that came through for infrastructure construction was off-site manufacturing 70 years ago. One of the reasons people like working with us is because they're a fun and great team. My co-founder, Alan, who's downstairs, has a PhD in deep learning theory uh, and optimization methods. 
probably more interesting than his PhD is the fact that he got it whilst working full time for Jane Street Capital, one of the world's most profitable algorithmic trading funds. Um, Alan also has, has worked as a, as a software engineer for multiple um, large corporates and has really seen software products being built from, a, from right from the ground all the way to complex machine learning systems. Vahan has a PhD in machine learning, large scale machine learning optimization problems from Imperial College London. Um, he, spent, he also has a degree in applied mathematics from ETH in Zurich. Um, Vahan is, has been our, our spearhead and helped us file um, our first two global patents, which went live two weeks ago. Um, and I used to work for Shell. I've been there and done that. I've been out in the field. I've worn a hard hat and fireproof clothing for eight years of my career. I've been on the tough end of the stick when my project did not go well, and I had to answer for why I didn't understand what risks I, would take, I was taking on my projects. I later then worked for the UK government. I was the head of emerging technology across government. I led and delivered the National Review on Artificial Intelligence. I wrote the document that was published last September, which has since released a billion pounds into the, into the economy for progressing AI. Our advisors are Lord, uh, include Lord Pryor of Brampton, who was the chairman of the Construction Leadership Council and, and, um, and, and was a minister for construction in the UK government. At Mplan, we're trying to rebuild how projects are built from the ground up. If we want spaceports, hyperloops, and floating cities, we're going to have to rethink how projects are built from the ground up. And thanks to our technology, you'll soon hear sentences like, High Speed 2 opened a year early and saved taxpayers billions. My name is Dev Amratia, and I'm from Nplan. We've got a stand in, this, in the startup booth. I'd love to tell you more about how this technology works as well. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, final thing. Um, we're hiring at the moment. We are a very small, young team. We've just closed our seed round. We are um, growing aggressively. We've got lots of exciting roles. If you're interested in working for a company that will transform the construction industry, nplan.io. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. Um, some interesting projects you're working on. Um, so we're going to take a few minute break, um, and we will pick back up at 10 past 11. So please relax, grab a coffee. We'll be back shortly. Thank you.
Next, we have Martin Gasper presenting from the quarry. Let's welcome him. Hi, I'm Martin, the CEO of the quarry, an agile data science consultancy for high growth companies. I previously worked as an AI I previously worked as an AI and data science researcher in a team of PhDs and academics, creating thought leadership pieces for and with household brands such as IBM, RBS, and HSBC. I work with an incredible team <clears throat> made up of academics, PhDs, as well as data engineers, business analysts, and of course data scientists, and we work together to create efficient and results-oriented and actionable business analytics harnessing the power of the advances in AI and data science to enable companies to become fully data-driven. Startups and businesses alike are passionate about their product and they want to go grow. Data-driven decisions help with that, as making decisions without data can lead to two things, either being lucky or wrong, and none of these are traits of a sustainable business. At the quarry, we help empower companies to make data-driven decisions and build them access to have an accurate and immediate understanding of the state of their business based on up-to-date up data in neat dashboards which help them to see where they should put their efforts in to reap the largest benefits. But that's not, that's not the only thing we do. We also help you with product development, VC, and stakeholder reportings. So, what are the problems you often need to tackle in a high growth business that isn't entirely data driven? If your data is scattered around the place, you aren't able to merge information together to obtain meaningful ideas. If you can't analyze your data, it's hard, if not impossible, to see how your business is doing. As a result, you can't determine the future of your business. You also can't make the best data driven decisions about the next steps to take for your business to grow. All of this means that you can't make informed decisions as you don't have data to validate or measure the effects of your decision. The quarry tackles these issues step by step. We offer three categories of sprints using agile principles. The first sprint is, the first sprint is uh, data warehousing. We connect all your data we connect all your data sources into one database, data lake or data warehouse. This allows you to offer an off-the-shelf data visualization tool, allowing you to see how your business is doing at all times at a glance, very cost efficiently. Once we have done that, we begin spin number two. It starts by identifying the right KPIs. Then, if you can see your, then you can see your immediate opportunities that the data has exposed, and you can make informed decisions for maximum efficiency. For example, you can see which customer groups are churning the least, so you can focus your marketing efforts on them. Then, in the third sprint, you will be able to get even more detail. This is fundamental for forecasting. Who will churn? When will they do it? That gives you the power to do something about it. This process is fast, efficient, and affordable. Agile is the way. Once the basics are done, it's time to dig deeper. We can help you optimize your product development, analyze feedback, and predict outcomes of potential decisions. We can help you find out where your next customers are with local or perhaps global analysis of your future customer base to see where the customers are who are waiting for your product or your services. We can also help you simplify investor reporting. We all have stakeholders and investors who need to know how the business is doing so you can make the process simple for them and also for you. We can help you save on marketing with segmenting your user groups, understanding how many touch points they need to do to become your customers. Know your best channels to radically maximize your sales and marketing efforts as well. So how do we do all of this magic? Simple. We connect all your data, <coughs> data sources to one database. Then we process and transform your data to make it usable. After that, we create your data management strategy, starting by identifying your most important KPIs. Then we create the dashboards you need to see the present state of your business clearly. Finally, we make predictive models to help you see the future as well. We do all of this quickly with maximum transparency and of course, in Agile. So, let me walk you through a rich use case showing how we helped our customer who is disrupting the music industry. What we did is we created an AI sales platform for our client that helps musicians plan their global tour and find their next venue for their events. So how did we do this? We started by analyzing three million artists globally 
using a 17-factor proprietary algorithm, pinpointing the most relevant 80,000 artists to the platform. We done this by using social data, internal data, and user-submitted data as well. We map their opportunities for, the, for ticket sales globally. This, by the way, has never been done before. Then we created a global venue recommendation system to plan the whole tours for artists with over half a million venues. We gathered artist data from a variety of both internal and external sources. We built scrapers, APIs, and modeled that data. Then we analyzed the presence of their fans and their satisfaction using sentiment analysis and identifying what does it mean to satisfy a fan base. Then we built maps showing the global ticket sales opportunity ranked by their potential. The next step was to add the ability to explore further fan opportunities based on similar artists by mass segmenting them and modeling the results. And finally, we gave the artists the opportunity to plot the best route for their tour, including dates, recommended cities, and the exact locations where they should hold each gig, depending on genre, size, and the size of their audience in that city. We were able to enhance the client's core offerings by creating a product that's focusing on the demand side, which are the venues, with minimal cost. We matched venues with their artists at the right time, for example, during their tours. We also matching the venues with the artists whose genre fits the venue, making sure the venue size is appropriate for the particular artist's fans. This product actually transformed the way the company operates, as their sales team now know who to target and have an automatically generated report that shows what the artist should do so they can approach them with giving them immediate value. It also transformed their core offering to their clients as artists now have a simple and empirical tool to use to remove uncertainty from their entire tool planning process. It also allowed the client to go after a new range of customers, the venue managers, creating a new line of revenue stream for them. And this, of course, is helping them with the future fundraising efforts as well. Thank you so much. We'll be at the Startup Village. If you have any questions, we're more than happy, more than happy to discuss. Thank you. Thank you there, Martin. Okay, next, um, we have Salman Valabik from Opiva. Let's welcome him on. Hi. Um, Orpiva is an AI frontier company solving some of the most complex problems on e commerce. So, where, where it all started, it started with this picture, and most of you have seen probably uh, this picture, which there was a lot of con controversy, like Kim Kardashian calling it like it's a visual trick. And, you know, I was actually as an AI scientist at the time working um, on one of the most, most complex issues, um, na autonomous navigation inside the body and mapping and understanding about the textures, uh, you know, inside the sort of doing keyhole surgery sort of, you know, procedures and, you know, doing autonomous robotic navigation outside, giving the patient access to, you know, uh, uh, to physicians from anywhere in the world. Actually, I was wondering, like, you know, what's, what's this all about? And where some people saw it as, like, you know, gold and white, and some people saw it as blue and black. So I thought, you know... Um, that's my curiosity started with this, and um, I, I was exploring this further. And to add to this problem, uh, as a human, MIT researched on, as a human combined, we can name 1,364 colors, like, you know, sushi green, uh, red Ferrari, and others. And this, this shows you that human, have, human perception towards colors, such, such a simple such concept, is different. And... Even further looking down on some of the sort of, you know, fundamental problem, uh, some of the studies shows up to 70% of the data is wrong, either tagged incorrectly or, you know, it's perceived differently from the human perspective. So we were looking fundamentally how we can sort of change the way we sort of, you know, shop and what's the sort of, you know, uh, process for creating the perfect experience. Because the current experience is somehow broken. And we have, with some of the retailers, we have up to 70% in return. 
Uh, we came up with, um, you know, looking at uh, how we shop normally, where we, in offline shopping experience, uh, which is quite fun. We sort of, you know, go to high streets, you know, and then get the inspiration, and then uh, find the product. We sort of, you know, try it on, you know, ask your friend's opinion you have with you, and then you, you make the purchase. But this doesn't exist online. You, in online, you go open 15 different tabs, going browsing through uh, sort of 15,000 products, and then trying to figure out what's the right product. And at the end, you more, order multiple sizes, and you return. So at Orpiva, we, we go back you know, to fix the fundamental uh, problem of uh, data uh, being broken. So we use a number of different technologies to, to sort of you know, uh, to, to alleviate some of the pain points. So first, we use some of the linguistic sort of um, tools um, to sort of you know detect some of the errors and remove it, rectify it, and we use state-of-the-art computer vision technology to have classification of what the product represents in terms of their style, color, and you know others. And then on top of that, we scrape some of the data from some of the brands and we amalgamate all of these components to create the clean data. As a result. We can actually find the products, and all of our products, we aggregate over 15,000 brands. All of our products uh, can be, or is featured with Find Similar, which you can sort based on the sort of style or you know, color as you browse through. And this shows like, you know, dif from different brands and from different sort of preferences you can, you can select it and you know, continue your journey. After if you found what you're looking for, uh, we have a state-of-the-art uh, AR technology where you can upload your picture and you can drag and drop some of the items on your body and it would show you how it looks on your body and you can get a perception about you know, uh, how these products you know, combine together looks. And this is further enhancing the sort of high street experience because in high street you can't just take something from some shop and you know, try it with others and make your journey. Uh, so this is, in addition to sort of, you know, high street journey, this is augmenting it further. We have another sort of uh, experience at the end, which is, we call it social shopping. Uh, so some people consider social shopping as sharing on Facebook solely, but, you know, with this, actually, you can dial up your friend. It's like a Google Hangout kind of experience. You can dial up your friend and you can drag and drop some of the products or items and you can share with them and get their opinion instantly. Uh, but this is one part of the story. There is, uh, the e-commerce is getting ever more complex. With, there is 9.2 touch points before any customers um, uh, making any purchase on any platform. So considering that, um, you know, this, for instance, the social element, uh, social is a big thing. The 33% of millennials, they solely consume their products uh, through social media where we created one of the biggest influencer network where we do audience development on top of that to sort of give them the exposure and then give them the content which interests them. Uh, so that works nicely hand in hand and since we launched six months ago we had 14 brand, brand premium partners including Topman, Topshop and uh, Boohoo and others uh, joining our team where we sort of facilitate uh, the key influencer which resonates with their brands through, social, so through audience analysis and driven by AI and match their right influencers. These are some of the contents which is being created where you know, the user-generated content outperformed 57% uh, brand-generated content. And we found that um, it's seven times more engaging than traditional means as such as you know, Facebook advertising or Instagram ad advertising. That's how we make that Orpiva shopping fun again, um, bringing the high street shopping experience online. Uh, we, are, we believe fundamentally AI is new electricity. Um, without AI, you know, um, your business is dead. And along the way, we help so many businesses and brands and our retail partners uh, with deploying the AI and you know, creating that, embedding that into their ecosystem. We are exhibiting at uh, Startup Village. We are happy to sort of you know, demo you further with our sort of core technologies uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you there, Simon. Um, please do check him out in the Startup Village. Um, we're gonna take a few minutes break and we'll pick back up shortly. Thank you.
Well, hello. Good morning. Yes, it is still morning. I was about to say good afternoon, but it's still good morning. Uh, I hope you're feeling rejuvenated after the break that you've been offered. Um, we now have a, another presentation coming up uh, for the lightning stage. Um, it is, uh, and I've asked him how to pronounce his name, so I shall hopefully get it correct. It is uh, Zbigniew Wonia. Yes, a happy, the, the smile of a Polish man whose name has been pronounced correct. You are Polish, aren't you? Or is that not a presumption? Okay, good. Yes, and he is indeed Polish. Uh, excellent. Well, I asked uh, Zbigniew um, for a little bit about what he's doing. He's doing an, an insurance tech startup. Um, we had a discussion over, uh, you know, what a fun fact of his might be. Um, he told me that he plays squash, which, you know, I guess is fun physically, but, you know, isn't as whatever. But he did give me a really interesting fact about insurance, uh, talking about what he said is the most niche insurance he's ever heard of, which is um, that there was a niche insurance story. That there was once a man who earned a vast amount of money insuring ships because he was the only guy who could calculate uh, the precise um, distance that Iranian missiles could go uh, as for, you know, cargo ships going through the Gulf there. So, you know, nice work if you can find it. And without any further ado, Sabina, would you like to come up? Thank you. Thank you for having uh, this opportunity for me to present uh, what we built in TensorFlight. Uh, so TensorFlight is about the access to information about commercial properties for insurance and reinsurance companies. So let me tell you a little bit about the product. If you enter this great dock, actually it's amazing. But if you are insurance person and you work in the properties, you will first think like what are the risks related to this property? Because of the last year's event like Hurricane Irma, Harvey or Maria, these things are highlighted in the, in the world. So we really have to make sure that uh, the insurance companies can pay back the, the, the losses that people, um, that people suffer from because of the catastrophic risk. But uh, for insurance, on the other hand, they must have the proper evaluation of the portfolios to be able to make sure that they can pay off the, uh, the claims. So there is one feature, actually, that is extremely important if it comes to the catastrophic risk. This is construction type. So what's the underlying material that the building is built of? The reason is, for simple example, if you are in Florida, when there is quite a lot of hurricanes, most of the buildings are done from concrete or masonry because these are quite resistant to wind. If you go to California, masonry is actually not the best material because even the weak earthquake could create such a pressure that the masonry building will be destroyed. On the other hand, in California, you will see a lot of wooden structures because wood is relatively elastic and a bit of shake is actually not harming the buildings. So this is one of the examples why the construction type is so crucial for analysis of the potential losses and the risk related to the properties. So it was estimated that just because of misinformed or missing information about the construction type, the insurance industry loses $4.5 billion, which is quite big, I would say. So how we want to help and tackle this problem? So we actually connect with different partners and we buy imagery about the satellite airplane, street view, potentially drones, it's not today done, but potentially drones in the future, to actually analyze, localize, and understand what's the underlying features of the properties that are related to risk. So here is an example of our platform. So this is AI-driven startup. We focus on computer vision analysis of all the imagery. So first, we look at the top view and we analyze different features from the top. For example, if you have a tree, it's very important for the insurance to know where, how far from the building there are trees and how many of them. Because 30% of claims related to uh, wind are because the tree was blown away and hit the building. So this is one of also very important features. After we understand the, the parcel, the, the neighborhood of the building, we actually start 
connecting with the Street View partners to analyze, to find the best views from the site, to be able to predict features and, and respond about the final features that the insurance companies may want. So after we got the correct street view, we look and analyze the street view. And on, in this way, we can tell about the number of floors, height of the building, geometry shape, uh, geometry of the roof, shape of the building from the top, so occupancy type. These are the most important uh, things for the, for the properties. So how big is the market? Obviously, insurance market is the second biggest market in the world after agriculture, but um, obviously, like, property insurance is only part of it. So we see more than 25 players that could pay quite a lot for optimization of their portfolio. So at least 25 companies could spend easily $20 million to better evaluate the risk. And if it comes to reinsurance players, these are just huge, huge corporations with multi-billion dollar assets to just optimize what they are going to insure. If it comes like the market analysis from the bottom, we see that inspection of the property costs on average around $500. And it should be done every five years, let's say. In only US, there is more than 150 million buildings. And around commercial properties, it's around maybe 15 to 20 million buildings in the United States. But every information about commercial property, which are usually much higher priced, uh, is, is worth at around five to 10 times more. So if it comes to the competition in this space, we see that there is few players already um, popping out in the United States, mostly focus on the residential properties. In the sense, no one is looking into commercial properties, and this is the biggest difference between them and us. To analyze the commercial property, we need to have a look from the street view, because there are different features related to the risk related to house than risk related to school or shopping mall or tobacco dock like here. And we obviously focus on computer vision uh, a lot. So what is the current traction? So we are doing five pilots with Fortune 500 companies. So these are like multi-billion dollar reinsurance corporation and one insurance. One of the clients already is requesting to analyze four million buildings per year, which will be very high value contract and we are on the stage of evaluation of our services. In the sense, we, um, we process some small amount of data and we are negotiating about the, um, the, the accuracies that we have to provide and the quality of our uh, service. And other companies are doing, with other um, clients, it's still on the evaluation part as well. But um, it looks that at the initial part, we will focus more on the service per building in the sense we will have like human um, in the loop that is like verifying uh, what our AI algorithms can analyze because it's crucial for them to uh, properly price the policy. So if it comes to the team, uh, me and Robert started this company. So Robert was the guy who is extremely well recognized as a big ML um, big data and ML engineer who can scale the solution to thousands of machines. And that was the product that he used to work before in Facebook and Google. And I work quite a lot on computer vision research and had few free benchmarks that were worldwide in the sense that we had the best um, recognition model on ImageNet with Inception with V3 together in, together in team with Google and the best detection model in 2016. And in 2017, we were the second uh, in the recognition of the cancer um, in the worldwide cancer uh, competition. And I work in all these companies actually before. Um, Peter and uh, Cho, they are our advisors who are like top leader if it comes to AI uh, from UC Berkeley at NYU. And our team currently consists, like the core team, consists of only PhDs and um, ex-Googlers. And there is around like 12 people plus, uh, plus founders. So obviously, uh, we are looking for partners, investors, insurance clients, 
and uh, if anyone is playing squash, please also reach out to me. Thank you. some interesting traction there. Does anyone have a question? Definitely the architecture, how the buildings are built is different. So we have to uh, prepare more training data, adapt algorithms. And I would say very difficult part, which we didn't recognize initially, is about like proper street view perspective. So actually get the good image of the building that can tell us something is very, very hard. In the sense, sometimes you have to just guess based on like small piece of the building that sticks out um, because another building is in the front and occluded. Or there is like fans, there are cars, people. So um, we have to play quite a lot with, um, with street view analysis, which is actually, I think, the first company that is uh, going in this direction. Break period. We delighted here. Um, so from 11:40 to 12, uh, we are chilling. Um, please do come back. Uh, we have a presentation from LifeBit starting at 12, uh, followed by a whole range of other interesting startups coming up in that period. Great. See you in a bit.
Right. Hello. Good to see you all uh, after the quick break we had here at the Lightning Lounge. Um, I've got to ask you your interesting fact about yourself. Uh, whisper. Ah, yes. I, well, I knew that. So, enabling people to make sense of genetic data with AI. Um, I neglected to ask a traditional interesting fact about the speaker, but uh, I'm sure she can furnish us with one uh, imminently. Um, and uh, with that, no further ado, I shall hand right over to LifeBit. Yes. Great. Hello, everyone. Oh, this is some good mic. Um, so I'm Maria, I'm the founder and CEO of LifeBit, and basically what we do at LifeBit, we build uh, B2B software that enables people uh, to understand and analyze at scale uh, genetic data, basically. Um, a little bit, so today I'm gonna be talking to you about how advances in AI and genomics are shaping medicine, and uh, yeah, and then a little bit more about what we're trying to do at LifeBit. So how did the genomic revolution even start? So I don't know if you know this picture, but this is actually the first picture ever of DNA, the famous photo 51, taken by Rosalind Franklin here at King's. And that was already more than 60 years ago. And that is what then led to the discovery of the, uh, of the DNA structure, which in turn then led, in the early of 2000, our, us uh, being able to sequence the first ever human genome. Uh, and to do that, we required literally an army of people and like US, France and UK coming together in a really big consortium to make that happen. From that we moved very fast to actually huge machines that uh, with minimal human intervention they could now actually read. We were talking about things like selection methodologies and uh, you know career pr prediction which is Charlie's forte and algorithmic matching but you know, as we were talking about this, this is where really the, the idea of AVA was birthed. Our office sofa actually was, uh, was getting a bit uncomfortable, so we went down to a pub where there was some beer mats that we could write all the stuff down on. And you know, as all good ideas start on a beer mat. Um, <clears throat> Charlie thought that recruitment could and should be automated end to end. I think secretly he still does. Ben wanted to have everyone matched instantly to their perfect employee by just voicing their desires to a Siri-like bot. And I just wanted a machine to do the drudge work so that I could spend more time talking to great people that actually wanted to talk to me. It's still all about me. Seriously, recruitment has some serious issues. And chief among them is that pretty much everyone hates doing the process, that's doing the recruiting, or being involved in the process, going through it. And so, even though everyone gets a job, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a process. A, a, a jaded recruiter actually told me that everyone gets a job. He said, the question that uh, is, you need to answer is, did you get a fee? That's just recruiters for you, though. Uh, the point being that recruitment is a process. And if you run it enough times, then you will, despite the complexity of the product, which is you know, a human, complex and emotional, you will get a result. And you know, you'll get a you'll get people winning a prize, which is a job. Um, so how do you make a brutal Darwinian process better for those in the process and tasked with running it? And, and this is kind of the, where we started with tackling the problems in recruitment. So the first thing we did was build our own recruitment agency. Um, we used it to deconstruct the process and to test our theories on real people. I told you it was brutal. The principle we followed was to ask a human to perform a process full manual and then to take that and see if we could reduce, eliminate, or automate the process. We rinse and repeat and eventually we arrive at a point where we've got uh, pretty much, I think we were at last count, 253 recruitment processes completely automated. Uh, we started right at the top of the funnel and we're still working our way through things that we think can be improved on and automated. But our guiding metric is winning. And by that I mean, are we able to select and shepherd the candidate that ultimately gets and accepts the job through this process? If you can't do that, you haven't won. So as you do this, you have a, a challenge in sourcing. And we tackled that challenge by 
looking at the total number of people in the pool. And we realized that very quickly we needed to work with more people in the pool. We needed to be able to work with very, very large candidate databases. But without employing 5,000 recruiters to keep a, just a medium-sized database up to date, you know, typically the ratios using a normal ATS system are about 1,000 active candidates to one recruiter. Um, how could we do this? You know, how could we tackle this problem? So we came upon Ava, a bot. Um, now, chatbots are not particularly new or innovative, or are they? We took the chatbot and flipped it on its head. So instead of it being uh, reactive, our chatbot drives conversation the same way that a human recruiter would. And it seeks out information instead of just being passive. And by driving the conversation and finding the information, we can then scale up recruitment conversations in parallel, unlimited number of times. And that means that even on a good day, a human recruiter talking to maybe two people at the same time has no chance of competing. So we're able to now work with large databases and large candidate pools at low cost, and our ratio is pretty much one recruiter to 50,000 active candidates. So as I mentioned, our goal is always to find the person that gets the job, and then to try and understand why. And it's in understanding why that we add a lot of value to the process. The quest for why is what leads us to AI, and it's you know, all of those things we like to talk about, natural language processing, machine learning, all of that. But we figured that actually in order to do this properly, we need to own every single data point along the process. And as we, as we started to realize that, we also realized that all of our competitors had identified the same problem. But actually none of them were brave enough to tackle it. So we, we, we did it. And we are able to interpret and understand the impact of every event along a candidate's journey on the outcome of the process. So for our competitors who are not doing this, I say that the recruitment process to them looks like a butterfly has flapped its wings on the other side of the globe. Um, quickly onto uh, our, uh, our, our kind of our key features that differentiate us. Uh, first is our chatbot, as I mentioned. It's AI powered for massive scalable recruitment conversations. Second, our UX, it's very, very clean. It's a workflow optimization tool that is data rich, light on clicks, and if you use it, you are taking action. It's not a graveyard for data. Matching, we use really, really powerful engines to understand the relationship between your work experience, the companies you've worked at, and your career path to predict where you will go next and when you will go. Sourcing, we plug into every database and uh, source known to man and are able to use our matching engine to surface candidates out of those sources. And finally, dashboards. Uh, we have AI-driven dashboards with pre-built reports that everybody will love. Um, and I think these five features in combination set us apart from all of our competitors. Thank you for listening, and uh, yeah, come visit us in the Startup Village. Cheers. Hello. Have you guys are all uh, having fun and enjoying all the uh, really quite cool talks and startups that we're seeing uh, here in the Lightning Lounge? Um, we now have uh, someone from Cambridge Bioengineering, Anil, uh, coming up to speak to us. Now, um, usually when people come up, I've been asking them what their fun fact is about themselves, but uh, in this case, I shall not so much uh, point towards a fun fact as point towards an amusing irony, which is that a man who is coming to represent a bioengineering uh, company appears to have harmed himself playing, was it football? Yes, hence the... Uh... Um, so yes, so my name is Emil. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called CBAS, or the longer version is Cambridge Bioaugmentation Systems. And what we do is we make uh, neural interfaces as a platform for AI-driven healthcare. And I'm gonna explain basically what that is over the next few minutes. So the problem that motivates us is chronic health and chronic health care. So the idea is that 
chronic health conditions are conditions that people live with for the rest of their lives. There is no cure. The definition really is that you're going to live with this thing and you need to be able to manage it. And what we try and ask ourselves is how can we make a, an AI system that is incredibly assistive? And we think that really means directly connecting to the nerves in your body that are going to those organs um, as you're managing a heart disease or a diabetes condition or, or arthritis or chronic pain. Day to day, your body is, is interacting with these diseased organs, and AI could actually be part of that conversation. And that's the sort of future we're working towards, and that's the entire mission of the company. And it's an incredibly important problem, obviously, at a personal level. For anyone we know, I'm sure, has at least a relative if, or a loved one who's dealing with a chronic condition. But it's also incredibly expensive for us as, as a society. So 86% of all healthcare spending is tackling chronic healthcare conditions. And, and so the promise here really is if we can enable an AI-based intervention that is really living with the person and directly looking after some of their symptoms, we could really make a massive difference in a, for a lot of people, um, ideally very, very quickly. So before we go any, any further, um, I'd like to sort of define a bit what we're doing and, and then we'll get on to why that actually is an important problem um, worth solving. So what we do is we make the open standard software and hardware connection to the peripheral nervous system in the body, our neural interface. So the idea is that we can connect um, once and then forever to the nervous system in the body from uh, the, the nerves that reach your limbs to the nerves that reach your organs. Uh, what we want to do is create a system that lets you plug into that, um, that part of your body to let, um, to let computing technology understand what's going on in there and also send data back into this nervous system. Now, we're all familiar with DNA um, and its impact and as we've understood it as a technology and it's biology's implementation of data storage. And we understand that in some very difficult, very complicated ways, treating it like that problem is a way to start to develop new treatments and, and new approaches to the way we go about um, you know, understanding ourselves as humans and, and tackling diseases. And the whole point about the nervous system is that it is in exactly an analogous way, it is the data network inside our, inside our bodies. It is the way that we send signals back and forth. Organ systems don't operate in, in, independently. Your pancreas doesn't know you've had a massive meal and might need to chuck out some insulin without signals that are coming either directly or indirect, indirectly to it from the nerves. And so when we set out to, um, as a company a few years ago, to build a neural interface, we thought this was the best way we could make an impact. So just by focusing on this hard problem of connecting, um, you know, really like sort of the, the same type of platforms you see that could run a, you know, an app on an iPhone, but directly making effectively like the driver, the software translation system between this messy biological internet that's been evolving for millions and millions of years to, you know, general, you know, machine learning and coding processes that we have available to us today, you know, we as a company became one of the first neural engineering companies in the world. And our strategy and our, our mission is to create this as an open standard. You know, we believe that by focusing on this one hard problem, uh, and actually, as you'll see, um, you know, making a few of the first demonstration systems with it, we'll open up a whole ecosystem for people to really innovate and build new treatments, because it'll eventually be a combination of, of all the types of, of diseases and conditions we pick up over time are, treat, are treatable, scientifically are, have been shown for the past 15 years to be treatable with the nervous system. So our job is just to open the door. And the last interesting point before I show you guys what we're actually doing today is that um, you really can think of this neural data uh, network as something that you actually have in your body. There are different speeds that are in different parts of your body. So when you think about moving your hand, it's a bit like using a dial-up connection um, if you're current, if, when you use current um, assistive technologies. And really, our body's got something like you know, conventional internet, conventional broadband. So our mission is if we're building a product for an amputee, can we give the amputee the broadband connection they used to have and, um, you know, so they can get touch back at full, full fidelity and control back. And when we talk about going to an organ, again, if we can understand and connect at the level of expensive broadband to a pancreas or a heart, then maybe there's a chance that people who, who really research these conditions could develop a treatment, develop a diagnosis, develop a, a combined automatic system that will one day replace a, a drug or a therapeutic. 
Um, and in the end, you'll, you'll hopefully, you know, within, 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 within let's say, the next 10 years, see people who are towards, the, you know, towards what we consider the end of their lives actually fitting, having uh, AI assisting them as they get older and as their organ systems age or as they have unhealthier diets or whatever, we've developed a way to work around the current setting of the body. So I think what's, what's useful to show you next is actually what a neural in interface system looks like, what our stack actually looks like in one picture, and I have one here. So, you know, the whole idea is that you need to be able to connect surgically to a, a, a nervous bundle for some applications, and we, from the start, built a neural interface for that purpose. There will be products, and there are products that are entirely wearable that interact with the nervous system, and we, we work with companies who develop those, but our mission is direct integration that you could live with forever. And these are two of the best surgeons in the world putting in a, a preclinical implant system that they did last year. And um, as that implant is fitted, it contains a um, onboard processing unit and some way of connecting directly to the nerves in the body. And as it's fitted, our cloud interface basically picks up that implant, makes sure it goes into the right place, sets it up, and then we get data coming back and forth from it for the rest of its life. And on board that implant, we do all the processing in real time of the neural data. So the role and our purpose of our main sort of R&D development team, and the, the first AI methods that we surfaced last year was about how to translate what looks like a really messy electrical static picture into what is, you know, picking up those on a few channels, a few electrical channels of the implant to translate that into some form of uh, understood neural activity. Uh, the biggest bottleneck actually has been that before our company started doing this, the largest data set in the world was 500 gigabytes of a combined EU research project. And now, if you believe in a future, which actually many of the largest corporations that, that develop health treatments now do, where we'll have algorithmic healthcare, the first thing to do is generate the data. So since last year, we've been generating data from different organ systems around the body at about five terabytes a week, sort of flat, goes up and down based on which systems we're studying. But we now have the biggest data set in the world of this type of neural peripheral, ne peripheral nerve interaction. And we iteratively develop increasingly powerful translation al algorithms to read this data that no human can do. And so what you see here is how we're now taking this into use. So Tris is one of our engineers. He's been with us for just over a year and a half. And what he's doing is taking the signal at the top, which is this long, messy time series signal, and turning it into this kind of, it looks like guitar tab, but it's the code of what actual neural populations are present in there. And our system is uh, on, online learning this, learning this mapping and translating it into a neural code. And his final step is to port it onto an embedded device, which is what he's currently playing with there. So really, the, the last, the, the, sort of what we're aiming to do is within the next year, we're creating a product for amputees and the first patients we'll to use is best in class neural system. And we've decided that is the best way to make a, a proof of concept impact and give it to people who can use it today. But the final step really is that because of this huge push into bioelectronics and algorithmically de delivered care, our technology and our data sets can underpin the development of a whole range of treatments for the next few years. So we're like the very, very start of the DNA type evolution where people can start to do neural engineering, understand the data, learn how to process the data in real time and have architectures that we hope to provide to build a treatment for you know, uh, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And that's us, that's our company. Thanks. Well, that was really, really interesting. I uh, look forward to the day I can start blending myself to some kind of robot. Um, yes, lots to think about there. Uh, for our next speaker, uh, we have a tool from SmartBot coming to address us. Um, I asked him a little bit about interesting facts about himself. Uh, he said that uh, he's an Indian, so he loves cricket. Um, we got that. And that if he could be one film star, it would be, and I wrote it down, um, we get it out. He would be Amita Butcham, who is apparently a very, very big film star, though alas, not one I know. Thank you for that, and please welcome him up. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I think let's go from biomedical engineering to enterprise world. I can't be that interesting as uh, what we just saw. It was very interesting discussion what you just see. Okay, so. What we are doing is, uh, um, I'm representing uh, smartphone biz apps, which is uh, into enterprise world. 
are the uh, okay let me just quickly flip it let me just start with about myself first um, I'm into consulting for last 22 years uh, I've got um, a lot of enterprise experience where uh, I've worked with a lot of large uh, businesses uh, different sectors like banking railways pharma so I bring a lot of uh, I will say business knowledge uh, in addition to that uh, what uh, uh, I can see the real pain point and I love the technology so I have combined both the things here. Uh, I'm representing a startup based in UK. Okay, so let me just talk, talk about my solution first. So we have created a cloud based application where uh, without any development you can deploy your bespoke application there. This application will have uh, multiple UIs like web based conventional UI plus you have a native app UI in addition to that it has got a chatbot based UI. So let me take an example if uh, I'm an employee as an employee I can just chat with uh, this application and uh, I can create a leave application I can just say I will not be working tomorrow and it will create a leave application for me. Or I can just say, uh, can you order uh, uh, three packs of A3 papers? It will just create a um, uh, shopping cart in the system. So if I just compare with the current world, in current world, employee need to remember too many URLs for different, different uh, applications. They have different uh, passwords. Sometimes with single sign-on, we can club multiple URL into one uh, single UI but uh, uh, then uh, there's a lot of training required because they need to remember where to click what to click uh, so there is a certainly a scope of uh, something like this which is very simple it can be assistant to employees uh, in addition to employees it can be extended to other partners like uh, suppliers customers uh, as a supplier um, enterprise supplier they uh, submit the queries based on email where, where is my invoice I have not got the payment so all those things can be uh, captured here so let me just move on okay so I have just used one pain, uh, pain point here I have just used a supplier example yeah nowadays what you found is uh, uh, every enterprise wants their suppliers to submit their invoices through a portal yeah and supplier portal is used for that but in real world adoption of supplier uh, portal is not great the problems are very simple ones small ones supplier has got 50 different customers they've got 50 different URL username password and they tend to make mistakes users getting logged and uh, what you find is uh, uh, it takes a 10 days or 15 days for enterprise to get uh, those problems sorted out so it's a very simple thing the users getting logged and all these inefficiencies uh, is uh, discouraging them to use the portal and they start sending the invoices uh, through email or by post or uh, by paper so all those things uh, can be addressed if supply has got a bot which is added as a friend uh, supply can just ping uh, the invoice number and then uh, they can simply see whether the invoice is paid not paid when it will be paid those type of things okay so this is a few examples which I have uh, given for example uh, we have created few uh, different different bots like bots for employees bot for uh, students parents and uh, customers different different uh, use cases we have identified and we have created those uh, and we have created a lot of pre-built applications as well so you can see here uh, I've given few examples leave application shopping cart they can check the stock of items they can um, suppliers can look into the invoice payment and stuff like that which is mentioned that so at this moment we are talking about uh, these bots being assistant to humans but there is a potential that uh, if enterprises using RPA based uh, bots which are task automation type of bots then this can interact directly with them so if uh, as a chat I can request something and it can actually go into the system and log in and uh, process the data 
So I have uh, listed down few uh, reasons uh, which uh, which could be a differentiator. Yeah, things like uh, uh, we can uh, uh, be used for uh, enabling the process automation. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our uh, cloud-based application doesn't need any coding, so no coding is required. That's why it is very fast to deploy. Um, and uh, there are uh, the, uh, the uh, 24 by 7 availability because bots will be available 24 by 7. So these are the key points which I have mentioned here. So uh, we are set up on a startup village. We are startup, yeah, downstairs. Uh, so you can come us for demo. We are happy to show uh, the application. Uh, and we are also uh, delivering uh, uh, one prototype application if you want to try it, something for us. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much for that. I would now like to invite Dr. Kiki Lutner from Mindex up onto the stage. Um, I believe you are using your own laptops, yes? Cool, I'll just give you a brief moment to uh, chat about that. Um, yes, well, for me, one of the really interesting things about uh, Cognition X, um, both you know, working there as I do um, on the research team, uh, and also about the actual you know, CogX event today, is just the sheer diversity of uh, things you get to see. I mean. Usually when you have conferences, it's uh, usually a specific industry vertical, say, or perhaps some little sub-segment sub of tech tools. Whereas here, you really get to see uh, innovations that will, if you believe, uh, you know, people like Jürgen Schmidhuber um, and many other people here, uh, radically transform not only the industries that we have here, um, but also actually, you know, ultimately what it even means, means to be human. Um, and I think for me, the incredible thing about something like the lightning stage is that you can look at some of these uh, startups who are you know, varying stages of the startup cycle, uh, some of them with lots of funding, others with none, uh, some of them with many, several millions of dollars worth of contracts locked in, others with you know, none. Um, and just saying any one of these, even the ones that look ostensibly uh, quite conservative in what they're doing in their approach, could actually prove entirely transformational. Um, and on that note, I wanted to ask uh, you guys sitting here, uh, the audience, um, I want to do a little bit of a, an experiment. Uh, so you guys have all, I am sure, I am sure have, have heard of NIPS, the uh, AI conference. I believe it takes place uh, biannually in Barcelona. Do I see nods, nods of assent? I'll go with that. Yes, I, I, see, a, I see a smile. Okay, I'll roll with that. Um, and what they do is they ask everyone who goes there when they reckon artificial general intelligence might be achieved. So what I want to know is who reckons that we could have AGI within the next 50 years? Put your hand up. I see lots of hands coming up. Who reckons that we could have, well firstly, okay, who reckons we'll never have AGI? No one, interesting. Okay, so we've had 50 years. What about who reckons we could have AGI within the next 25 years? Still quite a few hands. The cameraman has put up his hand, okay. Interesting. Who here reckons AGI for the next 10 years? Next five years? Mm, more conservative. I think for me, one of the interesting things about the work Cognition X does um, is a project I've just been working on, which is the um, Mayor of London's report. Uh, so what we did, the Mayor of London asked us to uh, do a bit of research and evidence base uh, for his policies uh, to help him understand the nature of the AI sector in London and what kind of uh, policies can be developed uh, in order to improve that sector. And that connects to the um, AGI point in that, well, quite a few of you put your hands up for saying AGI will come in 50 years. Another quite a few of you put your hands up for 25 years, but let's just consider the pace of change in technology versus the pace of change in social institutions and society. You know, do we really imagine that parliaments, civil services, um, pensions systems are going to cope with that kind of thing so quickly? Lots to think about on that. And uh, with her laptop work now complete, I shall hand over to uh, Dr. Kiki. Hi, thank you very much. Um, 
Is the mic on? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Kiki. I'm here to talk to you about um, HR tech and recruitment. Not the sexiest topic, not the techiest topic, but nonetheless important. Um, as long as we don't have tech singularity yet, we need people to write our algorithms for us, and they're hard to find and hard to recruit. And the good news is that the tech industry has woken up to HR, and um, I'm the head of science at Mindex. We're a small London-based startup, less than 15 people, but just about three weeks ago, we got acquired by Highview, and they're a Sequoia Ventures-backed US startup. Um, so that's obviously a really good success story for us personally, but I think it's good for the HR industry in general and HR tech. And I'll talk you through why I think that's so important for recruitment. So traditionally, your options for selecting the best people are either time consuming or they're overly relying on intuition or both. So you can do things like interviews, which we know result in hiring people who are more like you. You can do things like screening CVs, which we know result in discrimination based on education and background, demographics. Or the third option is you can do um, personality testing and look for attributes that indicate someone would be a good employee. That's actually the scientifically most valid option of doing it. I don't just say that because I'm a psychometrician. Um, but there's a problem with the market today and most assessments are very clunky and difficult for clients to use. And that's why big companies, they use it because they kind of have the brand behind it to force people through it in the application process. I'm sure many of you have done it throughout your career at some point. Smaller companies often don't engage on it at all and they resolve in things like stalking you on LinkedIn or relying on intuition for recruitment. And that's why Mindex was founded really to change this. And we do this um, by looking at assessment specifically and trying to create a solution that is both engaging for candidates and quick and at the same time scientifically valid. And we do it by turning assessments into games. That's the important bit. We turn assessments into games. We don't make games and then collect data um, the focus is on it being assessments that are scientifically valid. And um, you might have noticed the commotion on the laptop. I would have liked to show you some games, but somehow Apple doesn't want to do it today, so that's okay. Um, you can download the app and have a play yourself. Um, have a look at them. But our games, you can see a few examples. We have some of them that are uh, resemble classic IQ test items. So if you see the one with the shapes in the middle, you have to identify resembling shapes. But they're very adaptive, so if you get a level right, you get, it gets a bit more difficult. If you get it wrong, it gets a bit more easy. And it's very quick to play, so it's, there's, no, um, there's no annoying experience or anything. It's like just a fun and engaging game to play. And then we've also started creating some games that measure more social attributes, and that's what you see the top left is. Um, it's a chat bot messenger game that resembles situational judgment tests. So you're presented with every day difficult client, difficult colleague scenarios, and you're given answers to reply. So quite different games, a nice portfolio that we're building up and it's ever expanding. Um, and the most important thing is it's quick. So you can play three or four games and we can do a cognitive ability assessment. But you might say, is that really enough to tell whether someone is gonna be a good employee or not? And you're right, obviously games can't measure everything. We know, um, we know from research that there's a few things that are important in identifying someone who would be a good employee, who's employable or who has potential. And that's that they need to be rewarding to deal with, so they need to have the skills to build a social network. They need to be able to do the job, that's um, cognitive ability and they need to be willing to work hard. And some of these things are easy to measure with games like cognitive ability. Other things require a different methodology. And that's where it's amazing that we've uh, come together with Hireview because they do video-based assessments, uh, video-based interviews, and of course they use analytics on top of your interview to analyze your responses, and that works particularly well to measure things like social skills and drive. So you can see that with both together, you have two innovative assessment methods that can give you a really comprehensive profile of an applicant. And pr in practical terms for an assessment, what this might look like is you answer a few interview questions and record your answers, um, and that allows us to tell 
about you, tell, tells us something about your social skills and your drive, and then you play a few games that might tell us about your cognitive ability. And importantly, this experience is quicker, it's more modern, it's candidate friendly, but it retains a scientific validity. And I think from a company's perspective, it's a lot easier to have one vendor that gives you all these options in one. And hopefully with this offering, you can now quantify your selection process quite easily. The nice thing about our app is also that you get candidate feedback. So if you have a goal and try and play the games, it gives you a score and you can learn a little bit about yourself. So if you go um, on Google Play or in the App Store, you can download the MindX app and you can have a look at the games and see how you do. Thank you very much. And feel free to get in touch, email me, go on Twitter. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Remind you? Yeah. Yes. One question. Is that okay? Question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi. Uh, um, I just wanted to ask if uh, do you gen generally tend to do this for the companies or for the candidates, or is it two-sided? No, we sell this to companies, so they would be the ones that pay for assessments. You can also take the you can play the games in the MindX app, but for now it's not. Maybe at some point in the future you could generate a score and take it to an employer, but we do, for now we do it that the companies pay for it, just because that's the more practical oh, way to do it from a business perspective, yeah. Cool, interesting, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you integrate with an ATS or a CRM? Yes, so from the tech perspective, both, I mean, Hiveview is an established company and they have all the integration, but Mindex also, we're a tech company, so we have all the integration in place. You can ask me now. All right, thank you. Great, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Right, well. Another really, really stimulating talk. Uh, I can only wonder what uh, having that VR and some previous, uh, well not VR, so, some of that analytics on previous job interviews of mine, uh, where that could have led. Um, we now have uh, Andrew from Better Productivity coming aboard. Um, I asked him for some interesting facts about himself. Firstly, he told me uh, that he is from Jersey, um, which, you know, it's an interesting fact. I shall try not to hold it against you, Andrew. Uh, I am in fact a Manxman, which as we all know is the most superior of the offshore islands, um, but you know, it's okay. We are a welcoming and diverse spot here at Cognition X. Secondly, he also tells us that he has flown no less than 250 return flights to Helsinki, which really is a lot of flights to Helsinki. So, with no further ado, over to you, Andrew. I think we've got the uh, mics just coming on. Are we using the mic here? Yeah. Perfect. It's on, is it? Ah, yeah. right, got it. Okay, just... Um, to start with, a little bit about myself. Um, my background is as an engineer, but someone who's interested in business engineering. I had a career at Rolls-Royce Aerospace, uh, won a Young Engineers Award for implementing a project management system to reduce lead times on engine programs by six months. Uh, worked at Ernst & Young, management consultant for nearly 10 years, doing a lot of kind of big change projects. And then I started my own business 15 years ago called Change Director, and that's been providing tools for global advisory firms and very large businesses to help them to deliver more value to their clients and for businesses to, to really drive value and performance improvement. About a year ago, I got onto the issue of productivity in the UK. Um, in the UK, there is an opportunity for small businesses to be probably 5-10% more productive by just doing a few simple things. By doing that, it would add about 150 billion a year to the UK economy, which means more wages, more profits, and more tax. And that would significantly plug the gap that the UK economy has right now relative to other developed economies. Um, about six months ago, uh, we won a grant to do the design and feasibility study into a business productivity portal. 
and the project we proposed meant going around to lots of different small businesses, talking to stakeholders, so they had these growth hubs nationally. There's a department for business, energy and industrial strategy. So we got to work with a lot of the stakeholders around the UK. And going through that, we realized actually a couple of things that businesses, small businesses, and that's staffed between 10 and 250 staff. Um, and the common denominator was if we just uh, move on slide, oh, we've got a slide thing here, right. So what we found was a lot of the SME business owners lack the skills, experience, and practices to actually manage the businesses effectively by doing simple things like performance measurement, and mostly using crude financial measures. Um, some barely look at the P&L, you know, most of us would think the P&L is something you'd, you'd really major on, but very few of them, most of them are actually focused on very much on the day-to-day -day job and really struggling to keep track of what's going on. Um, management also lack a lot of the kind of structured reporting that you'd see in larger businesses. Um, I've spoken to quite a few larger businesses that have bought out smaller businesses, and the first thing they do is actually to sort out the management processes. So if we look at the SME market, where there are 250,000 SMEs in the UK with 10 to 250 staff, there's a massive opportunity to just do some simple things right and actually help to drive the productivity of the UK. So our solution, uh, which we've been reviewing with a number of people, we're going to start the business in July, so we're just getting ready to launch. Um, the first thing we do is offer a free three-day improvement plan review. So that's, first of all, to understand the business, to baseline the current performance, look at the P&L, any measures that they're using. And from the businesses we've already spoken to, we've already come up with at least 10% of revenue growth. If we look at the overall improvement plan and the initiatives that could be done to just come out with a list of what things could we do to make the business better. Um, and also looking at the kind of management reports that are used, they tend to be things like just action lists in an email. So the, the MD or owner would just write down, here are the things we're doing, send it off to the team, go back and review it, and that's about it. There is no concept, really, of a management report. Having done that, we've actually identified. So if you think of a business with, say, 2 million turnover, we could easily find... £200,000 worth of savings and benefits, whether that's looking at revenue or looking at external spend, getting more value from your suppliers, or just looking at operational improvements. And because we can tie that back to the baselines that we've created, we've actually got a measure of improvement. So putting in very simple management disciplines, which are mainstay in, in larger businesses, we can then go in and offer a managed service, which is bringing together management reporting, um, simple app that provides performance measurement, a list of the actions you're taking to improve performance, and a simple piece of collaboration so people can start to share and see where they are relative to each other. So, um, so as a managed service, we would typically charge around um, 2,500 per month per client and do about four days work per month helping out those clients to actually manage and improve their performance and they can stop at any time. So our goal is to really get immersed with the management team, uh, provide some tools and just help them to then see the fact that their performance is improving. So we've got a performance improvement plan that goes with that. Um, so having got the process working in a direct sense, we're then looking to scale up significantly. Um, the hubs nationally, of which there are about 50, provide a lot of advice and support to SMEs, and this is done on a free basis with government funding. There's many hundreds of millions of pounds that's put into free advice, which, um, so this capability and this proposition is something that they could be helped with. Um, so for each advisor, we're looking at a fee around about £20 per month. So something that's easily affordable from the smaller 
uh, advice hubs with maybe five advisors up to the very large ones like in Manchester which have over 150. So we can offer a sort of a pricing structure which is fairly straightforward to them and provide them with these capabilities that they could use and leverage on. And we've already spoken to three of the hubs nationally and they're all very keen on this proposition. So we've got to route through nationally to actually scale this proposition up. And then for the individual SMEs, we're looking at an average price of around £50 uh, per month per SME. So something that's quite affordable. And in terms of number of SMEs, looking to get up to about 20,000 within the next four years. So in terms of um, the business model, we're looking at a break-even for the first year with about 200k revenue from the managed service. And then progressively growing up to, if we can hit the 20,000 SME size, um, a good comparison with this would be to think out of like a product like Xero, a management accounting software. So we would actually connect into the Xero app and on a, on a monthly fee basis you'd have an add-on with the app. Um, so we'd be looking to get up to uh, circa 24 million turnover in four years and uh, profits of about 11 million. So that's our, our goal and our plan. Um, as a team, there's myself, uh, John, who provides oversight on the whole business, the board, and we have a CTO um, who also happens to be the England senior squash captain. So he's captain of the England team, but he's got an incredible team of software developers, which we have worked with over many years. Um, uh, so our investment requirement is we're looking for seed equity of about 150k on an SEIS basis by the end of this year. And that's to fund the initial sales, marketing, but particularly the software capabilities that we're going to build in parallel with this. We've been building a lot of stuff using sort of Microsoft stack technologies like Power BI and Excel and PowerPoint, but we want to actually create an app that's really suited to this marketplace and provide a lot more information around benchmarking. There's all sorts of data and measurements and things that we can add to that as we grow. And then by 2020, looking for a further round of investment on an EIS basis, getting to about one and a half million as we continue to scale and grow the business. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, do we have any questions? No? All right. No. Well, Thank you. On to the next one. Thank you. So, we have uh, another speaker before us, both here in the audience and the, uh, the listening world uh, for whom this is being recorded. Um, I would like to invite Omar from Personalize to come up, uh, who apparently uh, would, if he had to choose uh, amongst film stars to be would like to be Leonardo DiCaprio. And a very fetching looking man he is too. Thank you. data science and strategy at Personalize. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we do and the kind of people that we service. Um, and essentially our motto is to try and understand consumers better than anyone using our bespokely built AI and machine learning pipeline. So um, we've created a unique profiling technology which enables us to profile people in real time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we try and uh, profile people uh, globally across their social and digital footprint in real time. Um, no, we're not a spy organization, and no, we're not like Cambridge Analytica. Um, we do everything in a safe, GDPR-compliant environment. Um, and what we try to do is understand our customers better than anyone else. Um, we've A-B tested our technology against numerous uh, market-leading uh, advertising agencies in the UK and the US and across the globe. And on average, we're about 200% better across all their key performance indicators. 
Um, no, that's not made up. Um, and second of all, it's down to the granularity of data that we can get to, and also down to the recommendations we make for optimal advertising criteria. So they save money and save time and action on the insights that we generate in real time. Um, not to be cliche, but this is an image of Steve Jobs uh, not so long ago telling people that we need to know our customers better than they know themselves in many ways. Um, what Steve Jobs missed here, though, is that in the past five to ten years, there's been an abundance of services which have made things very cheap and accessible, um, and it's almost paralyzed consumers in the amount of choice that they have. And I'm, I don't know if you both have Netflix, uh, but when you jump on Netflix and then you realize, oh, my God, there's you know, hundreds of different options that I could watch here. What do I go for? You're kind of paralyzed by this abundance of choice. Um, so our vision is we want to power personalization within the ad tech ecosystem. Um, instead of just, you know, serving you up with retargeted adverts or adverts that don't mean anything to you, we try and really understand your behavior and serve up content of what you need when you need it. So if data is the new oil, you could think of personalize as a refinery. Uh, what we do is we find, extract, refine, and distribute our data. Um, we, you know, we've identified over 120 different digital sources online uh, that we can tap into to understand markets, products, consumers. Uh, we then extract that data, structure it, and clean it for us to be able to run our machine learning and AI-powered algorithms. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that, but I can't tell you too much, because uh, it is kind of our secret source. So these 120 different data sources we've classified into interests, sentiment, and metadata, okay? So interests tell us about, you know, we normally tap into social networks, online forums, blogs, about what people are talking about, what they're interested in, and what's driving them. Sentiment, we look at online communities to understand how people feel towards a new service or product, how people feel about a new music genre or a new movie, uh, and metadata to understand when things are being released, how many viewers they've had, how much money they're making, so on and so forth. So this is an example of our music taxonomy. So interests, we look at social media and understand where people are being interested. Sentiment, we look at things like SoundCloud, MixCloud to understand what people are saying about new music. Uh, metadata, we look at things like Spotify to understand what's streaming, who's streaming, and how many people are looking at it. We combine these three things in our automated pipeline to be able to understand the end-to-end -end flow of what a consumer wants to know and how they feel towards a product, and have they expressed an interest in this. This is another example of our film taxonomy. So again, the social elements remain pretty similar, but then we go and seek metadata from things like Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, and we look at blogs and reviews and kind of sentiment towards a movie through things like Critica. Um, so what we've done is we've built this refine extract um, kind of pipeline across many different verticals in the ad tech space. Uh, so if a user has a request for something like, um, I have this movie, I want to find the best people to target who are going to come and watch the movie, we can throw this request at our piece of AI pipeline and it will come back with an optimal criteria for them to be able to target that individual. We've, so a lot of people do what we do. Um, they don't do it very well, and we've kind of want to disrupt the way that things are working at the moment and bring our technology on the forefront. So we've built a unique taxonomy. It's taken us two years to build. Um, don't know if you guys are interested in AI or machine learning, are you? Uh, in that case, then, um, if you know what a training data set is, it took us two years to build ours, uh, which is kind of another competitive advantage that we have. Um, but we built this training set to be able to classify behaviors as and when they come. So we take likes and variables and features that you can get from social media, for example, or views, or you know, any, any other kind of metric that we can find. But we enrich that using machine learning and NLP to understand a little bit more and classify these data sources into our taxonomy. The main thing that we want to know about consumers is understand what they're interested in, because that's what drives people at the end of the day. Um, so we're not really here to spy on people. We're here to understand what drives them 
what they're interested in so that we can serve up content for them and save money on, for the advertisers. So a little bit more about our technology. Um, we use NLP um, services to generate insight from text data. So things like comments, captions, blogs, online forums, search. Uh, we kind of crunch it up, ingest it using our AI pipeline. Um, and we extract sentiment and extract, tokenize these sort of pieces of text to understand a little bit more and generate those additional features which we can use to predict behaviors other than you know, just going off likes or, or something like that. Uh, we also use uh, machine learning to predict um, the next steps or predict responses of behavior from users based on the features that we've generated and the features that we've extracted from the data sources. Once we've done all that stuff, which is all very cool, um, we store it in our universal database in a clean and structured format, which is very easy to query, which is what makes us so fast in comparison to some of our competitors. Um, and that's what enables us to power multiple platforms across advertising agencies without really having to do much of our own work. So our first challenge that we're tackling is advertising. This is our SaaS platform, Topic DNA. You can see it at www topicdna.com. Um, we <coughs> we uh, will be launching this platform in July. Uh, we've already worked with multiple media agencies in London um, and we've started to expand over to the States. Um, we want to understand people. Like I said to you before, this is the best tool that we've seen out there for you to be able to understand audiences, what's driving them and how best to reach them. Uh, it's an automated platform. Uh, it serves multiple advertising agencies through an API or plugging in straight to their own data dashboards. It doesn't matter, we're quite flexible. Uh, these are some of the clients that we've had in the past sort of two to three years. Uh, different clients that we've worked with um, all have very different interesting briefs and challenges and we've used the insight that we've gained in each one of these briefs to build our automated AI pipeline. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, this is obviously B2B, so you're focused in on ad tech. Uh, yes, it is. Um, our pipeline, we want to grow into sort of multi. Sorry. Can you hear me? No, just, um, it, I'll throw the other question quickly. Thank you. Um, which is Does each company um, have like an exclusive interface where they have their data set on their consumers? or do you pull all the data from all the consumers and then anyone can tap into the data set? Thank you. So there are three ways that we can do this. We, um, if a company has no data and wants to find something out, then we use our AI pipeline to go and find it. If a company does have their own data, they can onboard that onto Topic DNA, and we can kind of supplement that with the data that we find, so we enrich their data. Um, and if a company have all of their data and they don't need any of our data, they can upload that and just use the machine learning and NLP services that we've built in our pipeline to be able to extract the insight that we would normally give them. Uh, so there's, there's multiple different ways that we can do it. Um, like I said, our, our pipeline is sort of platform agnostic and vertical agnostic. So it means that we're not specific to ad tech. Topic DNA is, but what we are is a personalization pipeline. So you know, we have plans to apply this product to recruitment, HR, um, and loads of different verticals at the moment, but um, the, the personalized is the personalization pipeline, the technology, and topic DNA is the dashboard that we use to service ad tech. I hope that answers your question. Cool. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I think I might, all the way to the back, I think I could take this size audience to practice on my stand-up comedy, which normally doesn't go down so well, actually. So, um, so I'm James Dean. I'm the, uh, the CEO and founder of Sensat. Um, we are a, a company, I'll, you know what, I'll just plug in and then I'll, I'll need the, oh, this one goes through. Yeah.
Yeah, so sorry again. So hi, I'm uh, James Dean. So I'm the CEO and founder of Sensa. Um, we're a team of about uh, 30 people based here in London in Shoreditch. Um, and what we're trying to do is essentially something incredibly hard, but teach artificial intelligence how to perceive the real world the same way we do as humans. So just to sort of explain what that means for a second, I kind of, you know, for a second picture that you're not a human sat here today, but imagine that you're a computer. And as you sit here, you actually, you know what this is and that is. You can see chairs and myself and you can hear sounds and you can interpret things. Um, so how do we teach computers to really kind of interact with the real world the same way we do as humans? It's an incredibly important challenge because we all live in a physical world, a physical domain. So if we can really bring computers in to actually solve these problems for us, that's a, a tremendously exciting place to be. Um, so I've basically put a, a very, very short five-minute presentation together today just to kind of take you through that and kind of walk you through exactly what that looked like. Um, I wanted to kind of pose off with saying, okay, imagine if we could actually understand the real world um, using AI itself, and then kind of just say, how do we actually get there and achieve that? So what we're doing at Sensed is we're essentially building AI infrastructure that will allow the frontier technologies that other companies are building today um, to actually operate in about five years' time. So essentially we're building a physical world AI interface. What does this mean and how do we do it? Well, essentially there's three ways of getting there, or three steps involved if you like. So the first one is to actually take the physical world itself um, and turn this from being made out of atoms and actually made out of code. So how do we digitally replicate the geometry of the physical world um, and take a copy of that? Um, I'll show you in a second a video which kind of explains this a little bit further, but we actually do this using autonomous mapping drones, which actually give us digital replicas of the physical environment around us. Once we have this canvas, essentially the next phase is to come and actually add real-time information in. So how do we take real-time environmental information such as light and sound and where the people are um, and put them on top of this static 3D model, if you like? Um, and once we have that, we have something very exciting called an environment. Um, and using an environment, we can actually start to um, train artificial intelligence agents within that. So that's all very conceptual. Um, a little bit easier if I just show you a short video which kind of explains what this looks like. So this is, um, yeah, I don't need sound, it's okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is our office, there's a couple kind of uh, opening shots here to kind of show you this. And essentially, yes, yeah, so we actually needed to be very good at data capture, so using these drones. So we're actually now the, the world's largest, sorry, the UK's largest drone data uh, company, um, drone data provider. And this is what we're using, essentially these, these autonomous drones that look like the small planes almost, and they fly back and forth about 300 kilometers in a day, um, taking millions of measurements to the ground there. And this is what we're creating. So this isn't a video, this is actually not real, if you like, um, a digital replica of Edinburgh in this case here, um, which is the highest resolution digital replica of a city which exists in the world today. Um, so incredibly, incredibly fast red, rapid generation. And basically that's the canvas on which it serves to then start painting this environmental information on top of it as well. So, and then um, where we really work today as well is in uh, large civil infrastructure. Um, so how do we actually help a very physical sector, uh, the construction industry, where they have to go and measure things physically. How do we digitize and automate that process so they no longer have to go out into the field um, into dangerous places, which is very slow and repetitive there as well. Um, and this is just a, an event we had a few weeks ago um, with the High Speed Rail 2, uh, which we digitized the whole length of it as well. So fundamentally, the approach is uh, a little bit different. So really today, if we're training artificial intelligence, the way it's done is we build a simulated environment and we put our AI agents within this. And we say this is really fundamentally a bad way to do it. Um, so you're using essentially kind of gaming environments. So Google DeepMind, they use Atari. Um, you have, you know, spatial or S by improbable. So basically, these are sort of artificially generated environments. Um, in the background here, this is actually improbable spatial or S. Um, and when you look at this, this is just incredibly... Um, sterile, if you like. You know, that's not as complex as the real world is out there. So we say this is really a bad way of doing it for two reasons. The first one is it takes a long time to build these environments. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, GTA, the, the game. It could take up to three years, actually, to build these types of city environments. Um, and the second thing on top of that is that they're just not a good representation of how complex the real world is. So basically what that means is when we try to actually train these AIs um, and then deploy them in the real world, they kind of fall down. I kind of say it's a little bit like um, sending your kids to school online versus in, in, in real life. You know, there's a, a lot of exposure to kind of life aside from the textbooks, which is kind of important in making them be a functioning human being at the end of that. So what we do differently at Sensor is we build these uh, real-world environments. Um, and these are incredibly high resolution. So this is York. This is about 250 million data points. Um, essentially what that means is we've measured York every single centimeter and reconstructed it um, in complete 3D. And what this means is essentially we can start to train our artificial intelligence agents within real-time data sets. And that really gives us three different benefits um, through the traditional method. So the first one is that we want to deploy our agents that we build in the real world. This is where they can come and actually solve problems for us. This is where we can make money from the back of this as well and actually improve the way that we live. 
Um, and this is probably one of the most marked differences between the way it's done currently and the way it's done now. So imagine for a second um, we want to train an autonomous vehicle. Um, so what we have is we have training data we've put in there. So this might be things such as LiDAR data sets to spot cyclists, for example. Um, so what we find is that cyclists are fairly common occurrence in terms of training autonomous vehicles to spot these things. Um, so actually in the bell curve of the weird events we're going to see, that's fairly normal. So when we're kind of simulating environments and, and places and data sets as humans, we're basically what we can come up with as humans and putting it in there. But what you find in the real world is just like weird stuff happens. So imagine there's a runaway pram. Um, well, how will an autonomous vehicle respond to that? Will it actually recognize that as, a, as you know, something it needs to avoid? Who knows, because it's not within the normal bell curve of things it would experience. If you're giving it real data and the data is actually exists in the world, it starts to actually be able to kind of learn on the full bell curve of complex data as opposed to just what we give it. Um, the benefit of this is actually that we start to accelerate the agent training process. We don't have to go and actually use our reinforcement learning to actually teach it, is this correct or is it wrong? Um, we can actually use the black books of the real world and actually quantify what's actually happening out there to say, is this the correct answer or is it the wrong answer there as well? And probably the most fundamental kind of change this introduces is uh, a little bit of a guise if we kind of talk about artificial narrow intelligence versus kind of general intelligence is that actually what we believe is that artificial narrow intelligences which are pretty much all around us today in the likes of you know ABS on your car for braking or you know kayak for searching and booking plane flights um, are actually tremendously impactful in our day-to-day -day lives today. Um, so what we really should do is see if we can develop a common language between lots of different artificial now intelligences which together can begin to knowledge share and talk about the real world using a common language um, which means that actually that together they can create an ecosystem which is better than the whole um, of the individuals. Um, so for example, I might know about cricket, uh, you might know about golf, um, someone else knows about something else. How can we talk to one another and knowledge share um, so our artificial intelligence in a similar way can actually do that together? So just to kind of wrap up as well, um, you might have spoiled on the front, we had a picture of a donkey. Um, just wanted to kind of explain what this is. So we as humans can look at this and say, that's a donkey. And that's kind of incredible because we've never seen a donkey that looks like that before. Um, it's never seen a donkey that's those kind of colors. Um, and we normally have these kind of little, little toy donkeys we take around with us. And that kind of teaches that your mind in terms of seeing things in a 2D or 3D is actually very incredible in terms of how it can associate random objects and colors towards a, a, an instance kind of say that's a donkey. So that kind of just paints the picture of quite how hard this is. Um, and if we have time, you know, later on, come and find me and we can kind of go through some of the tech steps to see how we get there as well. Um, thank you very much. And that's just a kind of a brief whistle stop tour of kind of what we're doing in AI. Oh, I can take questions as well, I guess. If do we have time? Yes. Hi, sorry, I've only just come in right at the end, so sorry if you've already covered this. <laughs> but, um, so what's the um, main kind of access point to sense at? Who, who are you currently working with and kind of what's your best case? <laughs> Uh, use case for the product? Definitely. So I just came from the, um, the first stage where we were talking about smart cities. Um, and what's interesting about smart cities is that's a very large, complex physical environment. It's literally a, a physical city with lots of crap happening all the time. So what we're doing at the moment is kind of taking the problem of what we want to solve and going a little bit mini. Um, so we work primarily in, in large infrastructure construction at the moment, so roads, rail, utilities, um, and actually the build of these things. So it's an incredibly physical sector where we have to get physical decision making. Um, but actually from a tech perspective, it's actually a fairly closed environment where we know what the variables are, we know what the file types are that we're playing with. Um, so we work there. We, we launched our products um, in November last year, which is essentially a, a digital twin platform. Um, so in construction sites can have a virtual copy on their computer um, and seeing exactly what's happening in real time outside in the, in the, real, uh, in the real world out there. Um, the next kind of steps is to kind of take these core technologies and see how we can automate some of those processes. Um, so for example, one business case we have is um, on a road construction, you might have sort of 10 kilometers. Um, at the moment, they need to measure how much solar they move from point A to point B. At the moment, a person walks around with essentially a measuring stick and a GPS and they, they kind of count how much soil is moving. Um, so what we can do is just digitize that process and, and collect the data using autonomous drones. Um, and actually that improves it from about five days of collection time down to about an hour and a half. Um, so much, much faster. 
but the real efficiency gains are in actually giving all those numbers, complex numbers, to computers as opposed to um, people. People take about six weeks to put it in Excel and work out how much soil they've moved. Um, we can do the same thing in you know, seconds, essentially. Um, so what you find is that actually in construction, for that specific use case, you've really quantified what's happened in the physical world. Um, and actually, instead of that taking six weeks, which it currently does, and it being a guesstimate at best, um, we've really quantified in near real time what's happening. Um, which means the result is we can make better business decisions on if we're on track or on plan as well. Yeah, so we, so construction, so, sorry, I'll ask it again, I think, because the, yeah. So where will you be in 10 years? Um, where do we want to be in 10 years? So um, basically, for me, it's a very linear path. So we start off with this sort of baby sector of construction. Um, the next phase from there is actually improving, improving the scale and the, the complexity of the data we can ingest, so going to something like a city. Um, and actually, between those two steps as well, we're actually beginning to train artificial intelligences to actually take off some of these specific business cases at first. Um, and if we can build enough specific business cases, we should be able to build a core technology which actually other people can use to solve problems. Um, so I kind of think of it as like, imagine you had a really, really good assistant you trusted everything, and you say, go out and solve this problem for me. So you say, you know, take the city, tell me where I can put solar panels so I can get maximum efficiency for my electricity distribution panel, for example. Um, or tell me where is the best route to get to work, where it actually takes in factors such as, am I likely to get killed if I cycle, or how much air pollution am I exposed to if I take the train, for example. Um, so really having a better degree of kind of physical information together combined, um, which can give us better decisions from the back of that. What's exciting if we get there is that we don't stop in construction, um, but actually we can start affecting every sector which has physical decision making um, within it. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, James, and thanks everyone for joining. We now conclude the lightning pitches stage. Uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much.